Hi everyone, I'm Pietro Frigo, and today I and Emanuele are going to present our talk, A Journey into the Secret Flows of Indiram Romer Mitigations. First of all, who are we? Well, we're both PhD students at BUSEC, which is the System Security Group at the Braille University in Amsterdam. And the two of us have been investigating Romer for the better part of the past four years. Today, we're going to discuss the results of our last two years of work on this topic. So what is this talk about? Well, clearly, this talk is about Romer, and I guess you could have imagined that. But more precisely, in this talk, we'll focus on what was supposed to be Romer-free DDR4 memory. Indeed, memory vendors claim to have solved the Romer issue once and for all by introducing DRAM mitigations. So today, we'll dive into the details of these solutions that were previously unknown, and we'll tell you how we reverse engineer them. As you can imagine, we wouldn't be here today if we didn't break them as well. So we'll then tell you how we did that, and we'll touch upon their effectiveness. But to discuss their effectiveness, we need to first understand what was uh, available out there as a possible defense. So before doing all this uh, talk about uh, the new Indira mitigations, we'll discuss about uh, both software and how the mitigations were being proposed in the past. Now, since in this talk, we're going to go into the details of uh, a lot of this uh, uh, DRAM circuitry. We'll now give you some context and some background information about DRAM and ROM itself. So let me start with DRAM. When you think about DRAM, you usually think about something like this, which is a DIM. And you know that somehow the data is being stored in here, right? Well, the data actually is being stored inside these ones, which are the chips. And inside the chips, you have another structure, which is called bank. And every chip contains multiple banks. Now, a bank is simply a bidimensional array of memory cells. And a cell contains a capacitor and a transistor. Now, the capacitor is where your data is being stored, whereas the transistor is the gate to this data. Every cell contains a single bit of information. And uh, when you want to perform memory operation on this data, you need to rely on these other two uh, circuits, which are the row buffer and the row decoder. And now we'll see how these are being used. So let's take one step back and let's consider your normal C program where you say you want to perform uh, the reference of a memory address, right? Now the CPU can handle these addresses, right? But then when you take into account the DRAM subsystem, this uh, address doesn't mean anything for DRAM itself, right? So what you need to have uh, is another component inside the CPU, which is the memory controller, which basically acts as a bridge between the CPU cores uh, and the DRAM subsystem itself. And what it does uh, as a first task uh, is uh, translating these addresses in something more intelligible by the DRAM uh, chips. <coughs> so uh, for instance, in this case, uh, the address A1 will translate into bank zero and row one. Now, after the memory controller knows that uh, this is the real address you want to access inside memory, it will say, OK, I want to perform a memory read or a memory write at this address. So we'll just communicate over the bus. So now let's go back inside the bank. In the bank, now we're inside bank zero, clearly. And you will get uh, uh, to the row decoder uh, an operation which is called activate to row one. An activate command is what is needed to perform any operation uh, on the data being stored in memory. And it consists in basically bringing the data down to the row buffer. And uh, this happens by basically uh, toggling the uh, voltage of this line, which opens the transistor that, con that uh, uh, blocks the, gate the data. And once the data is there, it will be connected to the bit lines, uh, which is the one connecting it to the, um, to the row buffer itself. Now, once the data is in the row buffer, uh, you basically discharge the charges of the capacitor inside the, your own row which means that the data is not stored in the row anymore. So what you need to do to prevent uh, uh, data loss, clearly, uh, is to uh, restore the data inside the cells themselves. And this is by, done by another operation, which is known as precharge. And the precharge command is basically uh, the inverse operation of, um, of an activator. And uh, what, what you do, basically, is once again, you toggle the word line. And after that, uh, uh, you change the voltage on the bit line so that the data will flow back into the cells themselves. Now, since the data inside the inside memory doesn't last forever because the capacitor leak charges over time, the memory controller is also in charge of performing another operation, which is the refresh operation. And the refresh operation is basically an activate followed by a precharge. <clears throat> and uh, this basically allows the, the DRAM subsystem to maintain the data for a longer period. Now, by uh, DRAM standard, uh, it is defined that the memory vendors need to, needs to um, uh, provide a retention interval of at least 64 milliseconds. And this means that uh, inside the bank, the memory controller needs to refresh every row every 64 milliseconds. <clears throat> 
Now, clearly, if we would do that uh, at the end of a 64 milliseconds in refresh, uh, retention interval, uh, this would create a denial of service attack uh, on your own DRAM subsystem because it would mean that uh, at the end of the 64 milliseconds, you wouldn't be able to perform any other operation apart from the refresh. So what the memory controller does is uh, it batches the refreshes uh, in smaller batches and uh, it refreshes only some rows every 7.8 microseconds. And 7.8 microseconds is known as TRFE. And TRFE is one of the parameters that uh, um, are defined uh, in the DRAM standard. Now, what about the ROM merdum? Well, as we said, uh, DRAM is supposed to retain the data for at least 64 milliseconds, right? Well, what the researchers have discovered is that uh, if you perform specific uh, access patterns in inside DRAM, you may be able to trigger leakage a bit faster than that. And the most common uh, access pattern, which is known as double-sided, consists in accessing uh, two aggressor rows. Uh, and these two aggressor rows wrap in the middle another row, which is the victim row. And if you access them fast enough, you may be uh, able to trigger leakage in the middle row uh, much faster than the 64 milliseconds. Which means that uh, if some cells are more vulnerable, you may be able to trigger data corruptions in the rows in the middle. Now, why is this important for security, though, if they're just uh, spurious errors? Well, it turns out that they're not really an uh, error that happens randomly. But uh, indeed, if you find a cell which is uh, usually uh, prone to uh, a fall uh, victim of row armor, you can trigger this bit list multiple times, which means that this bit list is actually repeatable. So after its uh, initial disclosure in 2014, the security community picked it up quite fast and understood the potential of this uh, vulnerability. And the first thing they did was trying to figure out uh, what could you do with it. So they tried to figure out if you could bypass the common privilege boundaries, such as a, a supervisor or a hypervisor. And the first exploit uh, came out uh, just one year after its uh, first disclosure by Google Project Zero. And, uh, and basically, it was able to gain root privileges by a normal application running on the system. Not so long after that, a multiple exploits showed it was possible also to break the separation between uh, um, kernel and uh, hypervisor. And not only that, uh, but uh, people have shown it was also possible to uh, trigger BFLIS from a uh, uh, sandbox environment. And this brings us to the first axiom of ProAmbrum, which is uh, privilege, privilege boundaries are a social construct. Now, apart from this joke, uh, this is actually quite serious because as we just, uh, as we just saw in this uh, previous slide, what this all translates to is basically the death of uh, memory integrity. So after we state memory integrity is dead, the question then becomes, how can we get it back, right? And this is where we start with the looking into defenses. So the first stage of the defenses are clearly software-based defenses because they're the easiest one to deploy. And the first one that got proposed right after the discovery of Rammer was disabling flashing instructions. And what do we mean by that? Well, as we said, uh, in the CPU, you have the core that performs memory accesses and the memory controller takes, takes care of these ones, right? So in your code, you would have simply a tight loop with a reference of two pointers belonging to dif two different rows, right? Well, it's not so easy because after you perform the first access uh, uh, to uh, these two rows, data will be stored uh, in the cache. And uh, if the data is in the cache, uh, this means that the, the channel from the memory controller to DRAM gets disrupted. But luckily, in uh, most modern architecture uh, uh, that are available today, you have uh, explicit flashing instructions to invalidate the data inside the cache, like the CL flash instruction. So if you use the CL flash instruction, you basically remove the data from the cache, and this allows you to trigger BFLIS once again because you go back to memory to fetch the data every time. Now, clearly, the first defense that was proposed was, well, what if we disable this flash instruction? You disable the flash instruction, you break once again the, the channel between the memory controller and DRAM, right? Well, not really, and we already saw it uh, implicitly when talking about uh, all the different exploits. And this is, for instance, when you perform an exploit from a sandbox environment. From the browser, clearly you don't have access to this CL flash instruction. And how you do this is by performing, for instance, cache eviction. And this consists in basically trying to uh, uh, push out the data from the cache so the uh, address, the cache lines uh, that contain row 1 and th row 3 will be pushed out of the cache so that you can access it once again from memory. And apparently this is already fast enough to trigger BFLIPS. So this mitigation doesn't really work. Now, another option that was proposed was to perform tracing via the PMU, 
and the PMU is the performance monitoring unit. Now, the idea is uh, that uh, the CPU contains uh, a whole bunch of counters that allows you to uh, observe uh, um, events on the CPU. And the idea you would have in mind is uh, you want to observe uh, accesses to memory and try to detect anomalies in these accesses. Luckily, most of the CPUs nowadays provide a whole bunch of different counters uh, that counts uh, misses in the last level cache or yeah, memory uh, requests. And uh, by just observing these counters, you can see if uh, you have uh, an abnormal number of uh, requests to memory. And the idea is, uh, after you observe this uh, thing, uh, what you would do is try to refresh the rows that are being targeted, right? Now, the problem with this idea is that uh, doing tracing uh, from software is actually quite expensive. And for these reasons, you clearly need to trade performance for security. How would you do that? Well, the easiest way to do that is to tailor the specific patterns. So for instance, what you could do is uh, trying to detect when someone is doing double-sided or something else. And this clearly, and it has been proven in the past, it's very easy to fool. Because uh, if you tailor your uh, tracing mechanism to specific patterns, then everything that uh, deviates a bit from the standard pattern, it will not be detected. So also this one was not really an ideal situation. So then we just saw that basically it's very hard from software to prevent bitflips from happening. So the next stage uh, that came out uh, in, uh, uh, in the history of software defense against runner was, well, if we cannot prevent these bitflips, can we at least uh, stop the exploitation of uh, these bitflips, right? And it sounds kind of reasonable. And the way this was proposed uh, was by uh, uh, trying to propose physical memory separation. So what do they want to do was basically trying to enforce the same uh, um, separation level that, uh, if for instance, you have in the CPU between different uh, uh, user space or uh, uh, supervisor uh, levels, and basically enforce the separation also inside DRAM. How would you do that? Well, the way you can do this is by placing some guard rows in between the different privilege levels. So what you would do is uh, you will store all the application data above the guard row, for instance, and your uh, Linux kernel data below the guard row. Now, this theoretically should prevent attacks from uh, EL0 to EL1. However, this doesn't prevent attacks between uh, different applications in the same uh, context level. So for instance, uh, multiple applications could attack themselves. So you could trigger a bit from your browser and attack, uh, I don't know, your Word application or whatever. And uh, so this is already theoretically should be better than nothing, but uh, still you allow all the, a whole different uh, uh, bunch of attacks. Uh, another solution, which was a bit more fine-grained, was to try to uh, basically get this idea and make it a bit more uh, um, precise. So the idea was to have uh, a guard row in between every other uh, safe row. Then in your physical address space, what you would do is remap this uh, memory into two regions, which are a safe region and an unsafe region. And the kind of neat idea behind this uh, proposal is that uh, you don't need to throw away the data in the unsafe region, but you just need to check for its correctness, right? So you would consider the safe region as your main form of memory, where you store most of your data. And on the safe region, you would uh, store data that uh, either you care less or you use less often. And then before accessing this data, you would rely on uh, error correction or just uh, some error detection mechanism to figure out if the data was corrupted. Now, what are the limitations behind, uh, uh, behind these solutions? Well, first of all, uh, the first limitation is that bit flips can occur on roads farther away as well. And uh, because of this, uh, it means that basically you might need to have uh, way more uh, guard rows than what you would expect, which means that the performance impact uh, are quite high. If, for instance, if you want to use the approach of doing the safe and unsafe region. And the second limitation, which is probably the most problematic for uh, most of the software solutions uh, uh, that uh, we discussed here, is that the fact that uh, uh, inside the memory you might know you might have some unknown geometry of uh, uh, the location of the DRAM rows. So what is the problem here? Well, earlier we were talking about uh, DRAM rows, and we we're saying that uh, basically when you perform an activate command, you will uh, open a single row. Well, actually, that's not exactly what happens inside DRAM. But uh, indeed, inside DRAM, what you have, uh, you might have uh, the same row uh, wrapping around into different rows. Now, this is completely oblivious to the CPU and the memory controller itself. So the memory controller will, will still send an activate command to a specific row. 
However, uh, inside DRAM, the circuit might uh, be designed differently. And the data you will get is the correct one, clearly, but uh, you just don't know where the data is coming from. And for these reasons, though, since you want to implement the, the defense from a higher level, so from the software, you should know, you should be aware of these, uh, of these uh, different designs. And this uh, becomes kind of uh, uh, unscalable because uh, if different uh, vendors implement different uh, uh, remapping strategies uh, inside DRAM, it's impossible to keep track of all of them and figure out uh, how to do this. So also this solution is not really ideal. So this is all for the software defense side, and we saw that none of them is actually as effective as uh, they were meant to be. Now I will leave the floor to Emanuele, who will discuss uh, with you uh, uh, most of the hardware defense that have been proposed in the past. And then we'll take it over and uh, uh, dive into the details of the new Indiram uh, mitigations. Emanuele, take it away. Hi everyone, I am Emanuele Vannacci and during this second half of the talk we are going to discuss and explore a different class of defenses or rather we are going to talk about hardware mitigations. So the first mitigation we are going to talk about is ECC. ECC is uh, ECC memories are kind of memories that are uh, more mainly deployed in server environments. How can we find if a memory module supports ECC without looking at the specifications? Well, it's pretty easy to recognize ECC memories because if you look at the physical mo me module, you can find an extra chip compared to non-ECC memory modules. And on this uh, ECC chip, um, the memory controller, the system stores uh, re extra information, uh, allowing the system to correct uh, and detect uh, errors. In current designs, the only ECC aware unit on the system is the memory controller. And when, C when the CPU wants to write some data in memory, uh, the memory controller itself appends a certain amount of extra bits of redundant information uh, for error correction and detection. So server memory comes with this capability. If an error is detected, for example, caused by a ramware attack, um, the error can be corrected. Um, ECC systems can correct one error, while for example a 2-bit error causes a denial of service. However, recent work um, shows that it's possible to trigger bit flips in such a way the errors are undetectable and uncorrectable, making the attack even more dangerous than a denial of service attack. However, ECC is not spread uh, in desktop environment where it's uh, easier to find another class of mitigations. And I'm talking about refresh based mitigations. Um, one original Roamer countermeasure proposed is the adoption of the, a double refresh rate. That means refreshing all the rows in the DRAM every 32 milliseconds. Um, so basically, um, the memory controller issues a refresh command every 3.9 nanoseconds instead of every 7.8 nanoseconds. Um, while in practice only a small percentage of systems adopt uh, a double refresh rate by default, uh, modern systems allow, for example, to set up the refresh rate by the BIOS, uh, or even in the JTEC standard, it's specified that when the DRAM temperature exceeds 85 degrees, the system automatically turns into a double refresh rate. Uh, during our research, we often had to check the actual refresh rate, and a way to do it uh, is by timing analysis. Indeed, uh, timing a long sequence of accesses in DRAM and looking at the latency peaks caused by refresh operations reveal the refresh rate. And uh, for example, in the plot, in the current slide, you can see that a double refresh rate results uh, in some latency peaks. So looking at the blue plot, uh, that is a standard refresh rate, it's clear the difference with a double refresh rate resulting in twice the amount of peaks. Uh, largely, uh, has been shown that uh, doubling the refresh rate could not completely mitigate Roamer effect, and uh, we confirmed these results. Indeed, even shorter refresh interval, um, a longer refresh interval, could be necessary. And increasing the refresh rate does not come for free. Uh, indeed, frequent uh, refreshes cause performance degradation, mostly in terms of um, 
energy efficiency. So nowadays modules spend two uh, to five percent of the time just performing refreshes and increasing these numbers to 10 till 35 um, percent will not be feasible not for laptops not for smartphone where you would see your battery life dropping faster not for data centers when energy consumptions are important and must be taken into account these are the main reasons why doubling the refresh rate uh, is not an optimal solution it's, and uh, it's rarely uh, considered um, so another solution is called para um, aka probabilistic adjacent row activation Mm, so Para try to reduce the number of refreshes required to mitigate the warmer and to do it, it defines a parameter P. So P, it's a probability uh, and every time a row is activated and then closed with a certain probability P, the adjacent rows are activated. Uh, the main advantage of Para is that it is stateless, meaning that it doesn't keep any counters or data structure and so also the overhead uh, it's uh, very low. However, uh, the main disadvantage is that the memory controller has no uh, knowledge of the memory geometry that is required to refresh and to activate the adjacent row. Mm, but we have also other kind of um, mitigations and can be noticed how the trend uh, through the mitigation design is to reduce the number of refresh operation more and more. So we started with a double refresh frequency when the memory controller issues refresh operation to refresh all the rows in the DRAM array twice compared to a standard refresh rate. Going through PARA where you define a parameter P trying to limit the number of refreshes and then the natural step forward is to try to refresh only the victim rows. So try to identify a rammer attempts, identifying which are the aggressors and then refresh only rows that are likely victims. So let's talk about PTRR or a pseudo target refresh. That is a mitigation introduced by Intel to protect DDR3 systems. And the key idea is to is that the memory controller must monitor row activation and then performs a target targeted refresh on the victim rows. Um, so um, the disadvantage is here is that no details are available. The only source of information is an Intel presentation that you can find online. And uh, here I reported a snapshot of this presentation where it's defined also the concept of compliant DDR3 DIMMs that is uh, um, that is unknown what it means. Um, yeah, so. What compliant DIMS means? The, the answer can be found, can be found in the, the serial presence detect. Um, so the serial presence detect is a read only memory chip, uh, on the DIM itself. And it contains uh, some information, like for example, um, information about uh, the manufacturing date, about the manufacturer, about the timing constraints of the DIM, of the DRAM. And also it, com it includes uh, this field called uh, MAC, maximum activation count, that uh, specifies how many activation a row can afford before the adjacent rows start uh, experimenting uh, mm, bit flips. And this uh, maximum activation count can, can mm, mm, take mm, three different uh, kind of values. The first is untested meaning that uh, the uh, MAC is not available, unlimited, meaning that the DM itself is roamer free. And this is interesting, inter interesting because it could mean that um, the DIMMs, the DRAM substrate is uh, uh, not vulnerable to roamer, but it could it could also mean that the, there are older um, mitigations in place uh, they're directly implemented in DRAM and we will um, investigate this option later or a discrete value for example 300k so 
we carry out an experiment to see if the pseudo target refresh is really implemented. So we picked up two um, machines. The first one is the one uh, reported in the, in the Intel presentation. And the second one is a desktop machine. So uh, with a Mac value set on unlimited, the amount of flips it's, uh, that we could observe is uh, pretty the same, but uh, setting the Mac value to uh, 400K, we could see a dropping in the amount of flips on the Xeon machine. And this leads us to conclude that uh, pseudo target refresh were actually working on the Xeon machine but not on the desktop machine and that the DIM itself uh, has a capability to support pseudo target refresh. But we tested also other machines and we could conclude that uh, pseudo target refresh is a mitigation that is supported but is uh, uh, mainly dormant and uh, disabled in uh, um, most uh, of the systems. But why? Uh, the answer is that probably there are other mitigations uh, like target refresh. Uh, now we are going to investigate uh, another class of mitigations. Uh, so far we, are, we have seen uh, um, software mitigations and mitigation that uh, um, works, uh, that work with um, memory controller support but here we are going to investigate the DDR4 landscape and the Indira mitigations. So mitigations that are um, directly completely deployed and implemented in the DRAM circuit without any support from external components like the memory controller, for example. And here you can see in this slide, a timeline, um, describe the introduction of target refresh like mitigations. So pseudo target refresh has been introduced in 2013 to protect DDR3 systems, but it's possible to find it also on the fourth generation DDR4 devices. While we analyzed a batch of 42 devices, uh, we could speculate that in the RAM target refresh uh, has been deployed only starting from 2016. And for two reason, uh, our batch, uh, we, we decided to analyze memory uh, built after the mainly after 2016 and one DIM after um, 2015. So previous reports of bit flips on DDR4 devices questioned the effectiveness of target refresh, and this is the reason why we will we wanted to investigate more target refresh design. But what is target refresh? So Target refresh is not a single mitigation, it's more like an umbrella term. Um, umbrella term is a, like a concept and it defines um, an umbrella of mitigation that uh, try to track uh, row activations and prevent uh, errors. How? Uh, targeting refreshing uh, victim rows. So there is no support from the memory controller because uh, also the memory controller has no knowledge of the memory geometry and the solutions are, are completely embedded in the DRAM circuitry. Target refresh um, was uh, originally introduced with a JDAC DDR4 standard, but then it was removed um, in the revision B. However, uh, memory vendors are still advertising runner free memory modules. And this because they are probably, they are likely um, implementing and deploying their own solutions. And so the landscape is so fragmented and there are no details because uh, um, vendors are enforcing the security by obscurity principle. And this leads to um, Dif too difficult uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of target refresh since the no real evaluation and assessment is possible. Uh, so to study target refresh design, we decided to abstract from the single implementation and we identified two components that um, target refresh design should include to work properly. And the first one is the sampler, that is the component um, that monitors row activations and inform other components about which rows must be refreshed. 
So for example, the inhibitor uh, get uh, this information and it can decide to refresh victims on the, it can perform other kind of uh, action, like for example, remapping. And in this example, you, we can see a target refresh controller with a sampler and an inhibitor that they communicate. And the sampler, you can imagine the sampler as a cache. And when a row address is specified, uh, the row address fill one empty slot on the sampler, um, on the sampler. And then when we can go on, for example, specifying row seven, then row zero, and then row one. And at this point, when we specify another address, one um, slot must be evicted from the sampler. And so we can evict also row seven. And if we repeat this sequence of um, access, we can, for example, hammer uh, row five and row seven. So uh, we can evict them from the sampler and when the inhibitor will ask for our row address to refresh, uh, it will uh, get, uh, for example, R1, but we, are, we want to armor, for example, row five and row seven. So this is just an example to better understand how target refresh uh, works. We needed to reverse engineer uh, our uh, DIM implementations, but reverse engineering uh, poses some challenges. Uh, first of all, analysis from the CPU side is not feasible anymore because the memory controller provides a very high interface. We cannot specify sequence of commands. Uh, we don't have control over optimizations and uh, we don't have side channels because the DRAM is a synchronous device. Um, Operation must uh, rely on uh, specific timing constraints, and so we don't have uh, any timing signal. We we will need uh, an FPGA-based memory controller, and uh, we found it in SoftMC, an um, um, FPGA-based memory controller infrastructure, allowing us to issues uh, to issue specific sequence of commands like uh, row activations uh, and uh, refresh command. So we want to um, reverse engineering the sampler size, how issuing specific commands uh, by softmc, and uh, of course targeting more than two aggressor rows because we want to fill the sampler and see what happened. We discovered a new hammering pattern that we dubbed uh, the many-sided row armor, in which we basically pick n aggressor rows with n greater than two, and they these are our aggressor rows. So we armor from two to twenty aggressor rows, in contrast to the state-of-the-art armoring pattern. Why? Uh, why it should be clear to lead the sampler to discard a few rows and then uh, to get flips. So our methodology, uh, we designed an experiment, we picked uh, n aggressor rows, we perform a series of armors, let's say 8k activations, and after each series of armors, we issue R refreshes. This for 10 rounds, and then we looked for row armor bit flips. So uh, after our case studies, uh, we could conclude that target refresh is enabled, and uh, it's mitigating row armor on every refresh command. So it's acting on refresh command. On every refresh command, the sampler uh, picks some row and or the inhibitor refresh some other row. And the mitigation can sample more than one aggressor per refresh interval. So on every refresh, the sample can pick more than one refresh. And the mitigation can refresh only a single victim within a refresh operation. This is probably because of uh, timing constraints. The more important is that sweeping the number of refresh operations and aggressor rows reveal the sampler size. So we could reverse engineer the sampler size. And then we saw that the sampling mechanism is affected by the, ad the addresses of aggressor rows. Uh, so, 
we found that DDR4 substrate is much more, is much more vulnerable than uh, the old DDR3 uh, because we could get bit flips with less than 5K, 550k activation per aggressor. Uh, so it's possible to overfill the sampler getting flips and uh, victim rows may not be properly refreshed by the inhibitor and this is because we are getting flips. So inhibitor there are some inhibitor properties like uh, the inhibitor could be timing based, meaning that it acts, it acts uh, on um, every second, on third or uh, fourth um, activation on the, um, after the start of the refresh interval, or it could be frequency based, meaning that it acts uh, with a fixed frequency and uh, it, the inhibitor could still um, refresh uh, 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 operation uh, to refresh victim rows. So yeah, we could reverse some dims. We solved the one problem, but uh, yeah, how many dims we could re we could reverse engineer to to close uh, the case. So um, reverse engineering is not scalable. It does not scale. So we decide to. Uh, go for another approach and we designed the trespass and we wrote, we wrote our paper trespass in collaboration with uh, the Safari group at uh, ETH of Zurich and uh, Qualcomm. And uh, trespass is a raw fuzzer, meaning that it's a black box uh, uh, fuzzer uh, and to, to scale this approach on uh, many many dims and uh, automatically uh, find hammering patterns. So uh, in our hammering pattern we randomize the number of aggressor rows, meaning that we could uh, hammer 5, 7, 10, 20 aggressor rows and we could also randomize the location because we have found that uh, the addresses of the row uh, affect, affect the sampler, meaning that the sampler could uh, um, it may um, sample some rows more likely than others based on their address. And we could trigger bit flips or we, or even with trespass. So we found that uh, target refresh is not secure, uh, secure at 100%. It is um, discreetly effective against state of the art hammering patterns because we could not find any bit flips uh, with state of the art hammering patterns uh, with uh, on our batch of dims, but we found dims that uh, uh, were vulnerable are, vul are vulnerable to novel patterns like the many sided hammering patterns. Uh, the natural question that arises is. Uh, what if we, if we combine uh, target refresh with other kind of defenses? So for example, a double refresh rate. Well, we did it. We still g g got flips. So doubling the refresh rate is not a solution. What about ECC? Uh, we didn't test uh, ECC combined with target refresh, mainly because uh, we were working on desktop environment, but we, I believe that Combining the many-sided row armor with uh, techniques described in the EC ECC ploit uh, uh, paper where you can um, uh, reverse engineering the ECC functions and find uh, bit flips that are not detectable or correctable. Then combining these two techniques, uh, you can still get flips probably. Uh, to summarize, uh, software mitigations have I overread most of the case. Uh, they lack uh, of memory geometry information, while other mitigations are, uh, they usually have a lower of red, but they are hardly deployable. Uh, we have fragmented solution, think about uh, target of raw refresh, for example, where each vendor uh, implement uh, its own version and there is missing of a standard. So in conclusion, uh, DDR4 devices are even more vulnerable than previous versions, so like DDR3 devices. Um, all major vendors are affected by Rohammer. We found that 90% of the market is affected. Uh, and uh, fuzzing can help evaluating the effectiveness of mitigation like target to refresh. 
However, uh, Rammer is still a problem uh, after almost 10 years, and uh, we don't have a prompt mitigation available for deployment. So this means that uh, an effort from the security community and the industry is still required. Thank you for the attention. How much hardware engineering knowledge is required to research about raw hammer attack? Do you want to take it, Emanuele? Of course. Uh, so, uh, before this question, I have a quick note. So we noticed a mistake on the slides. Uh, when I was talking about the inhibitor that could be uh, time-based or, uh, or uh, uh, frequency-based, I actually mean the, the sampler. So it's the sampler that could be uh, time-based or frequency-based. Uh, apart from that, uh, about the questions. Um, so, of course, you need some knowledge about the uh, DRAM technology, so about the DRAM architectures. And... Uh, yeah, it is, it's really hard to define uh, the, the actual knowledge you, you need uh, in, uh, um, in this field because you are doing research. So it's uh, always good to have uh, general knowledge about uh, programming, uh, but about uh, also DRAM architecture and uh, uh, engineers in general. So, yeah, it, do, you, do you want to add something? Pedro? Is there a certain uh, programming yeah. language that, that is more distinct so, to hardware engineering? Uh, we could do the trespass in, uh, in C, but you could do, you may do it also in C++, other languages. So a language that uh, allows you to uh, have uh, enough control over the addresses uh, you, are the, you are targeting, it's enough, I guess. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, well, the other part, like having other knowledge, I think it's useful. For instance, uh, it was useful for us to, uh, um, to build a trespass and to do the reverse engineering. Uh, but also none of us has uh, actually a hardware background. So we're both coming from a computer science background. And uh, I think it's uh, like it helps, uh, but it's not mandatory. For the exploitation side, uh, not useful at all. I mean, you don't really need to know how you trigger the bit flips. It's mostly uh, to understand, like, uh, for instance, in this case with DDR4, was we needed to understand uh, how to get there. Once you know how to get there, you just uh, use any pattern. You can just trigger a bit flips, and that's fine for exploitation. From the uh, programming language, I think it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I mean, like, uh, there were exploits even in JavaScript, so, like, I don't think there is anything higher level than that. Uh, so, I mean, once you know how these uh, uh, attacks that you build uh, translate to memory accesses, uh, you can do it basically with every language. Uh, clearly, for a starting point, probably it's better to use something like uh, C or any programming language where you can uh, uh, build, uh, like, when you have more control over the memory, as Emanuele said. All right, wonderful. Uh, we've got another question. In your opinion, what sort of software mitigation is most relevant when hardware mitigation is not available? <laughs> well, um, my idea is that a targeted refresh is not so bad in the end because it can uh, really uh, mitigate the state of the art uh, uh, rumor attacks. I mean, uh, it is. Not secure at 100%, but uh, uh, it's an improvement. And uh, I think in the future, we will see more and more uh, uh, mitigations uh, implemented directly in the RAM without any support of the system, uh, for example, by the memory controller side. So yeah, uh, maybe um, target refresh in combination with ECC is the best solution for now. Uh, what do you think, Pietro? I think, uh, yeah, uh, it really depends on the support that the machine has. So as I was saying, like a target refresh, it's quite uh, decent uh, considering uh, like the amount of effort you need to trigger B-flips. I think like a possible, uh, like an interesting solution, which is a bit uh, uh, less uh, demanding in the sense of uh, requirements of the systems uh, is uh, PARA. <laughs> Which is, uh, is still, uh, I mean, these are some, they're like uh, in between hardware and software because they're still uh, implemented like uh, at the CPU side. Uh, but for instance, like Para was uh, uh, introduced in some uh, uh, laptops uh, via BIOS updates. Uh, and uh, you just uh, basically introduce some extra refreshes. Uh, and I think that's pretty good because uh, it doesn't require any uh, 
any support basically from uh, from the other from the DRAM device is just the uh, the CPU side, and it just does uh, extra activations. And depending on the probability, probability you set, you get more and or less uh, uh, security. On software software side, I don't really think there is much you can do. I think I mean like you could design some. Uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, a specific mitigation for specific use cases. Uh, so you want to prevent uh, the exploitability of specific uh, bit flips uh, in the browser. Then you can target it directly on uh, on the browser itself by doing something with uh, pointers, like trying to avoid uh, uh, like uh, the possibility to corrupt pointers or something like that, uh, which is something like what they did for Spectrum Meltdown now. Uh, but uh, I don't see it like in software itself to be uh, a possible solution uh, uh, for for Runner. So yeah, I think it's uh, like probably Para. It would be my best bet for uh, something that doesn't require support. Uh, yeah, in terms of server security, I, I think uh, I agree. I was more thinking about uh, DRAM uh, uh, mitigations, but if yeah, you think yeah. uh, at mitigation that uh, you can uh, use uh, with the uh, memory controller support, uh, Para is uh, the best solution also for me. Okay, thank you. And we have one final question for your talk. From an offensive security perspective, what upcoming DRAM technology are you most excited with and why? Well, of course, we would like to experiment more with the DDR5 uh, uh, DRAMs uh, coming soon, I hope, uh, because uh, uh, we actually don't know if uh, they will be deployed with some uh, uh, rumor mitigations or... Uh, the same situation that uh, we have seen with uh, DDR4 will be repeated. So yeah, I think that the uh, DDR5 uh, uh, devices are the most... Uh, yeah, yeah I agree. For them. I agree, DDR5 is uh, probably the most interesting uh, bit now because uh, of the trend that Emanuel was talking about also during the talk that uh, DDR3 was uh, in its own like less vulnerable than DDR4 because uh, it had like less uh, cells inside the memory. DDR5 is going to be even more packed, so most likely the substrate is going to be more vulnerable. So, yeah, that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, another technology I think it could be interesting to look at uh, is, uh, um, I think it's called the PIM, uh, which is like a memory with, with also like a in-memory in computation capabilities. So it has some uh, microcontroller on the DRAM itself to perform computations. And I think also that one could be an uh, interesting target uh, to look at also for defensive side, maybe. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that I really didn't uh, think about. Like, I think DDR5 at the moment is the most logical step to look uh, into just uh, DDR3, DDR4, DDR5 is coming. LPDR5 is already out, I discovered uh, last week, so um, it's something that uh, it's worth looking into, I think. All right, wonderful. And with that, I think that comes to the end of this talk. Thank you so much, Manuel, Pietro, for your talk. I hope everyone had fun. I hope you had fun.